do have uh, Josh Side and I. Josh and I wrote Lean UX together. We wrote Sense and Respond together. And we are writing another book together called Who Does What by How Much? That's the name of this talk. That's the name of the book. Uh, it's a conversation about objectives and key results. And if you like what I'm saying, this is this this talk is a preview of the content in the book. If you like what you hear, you're interested in reading more. If you go to that website, okr-book.com, there's just a, at this point a fairly simple uh, sign up form there, and we'll send you an email when the book is ready, and should be about uh, April fifteenth. Okay, so let's let's jump into it. This was February 22nd, 2020. Okay, that's me. It's probably you can tell. Uh, those uh, are my daughters who looks four years. They look so much older these days. But uh, uh, those are my daughters. And we are at a uh, Barcelona football match, a soccer game at the old Barcelona stadium called Camp No, which has now been torn down. They're rebuilding it. Um, there were 100,000 people in that stadium that day. And if you've ever been to a game in that old stadium, right, you know that you sit there like this. It's part of the reason they're, they've torn it down and are rebuilding it is because it is a, uh, it was an uncomfortable stadium and it wasn't very modern. And everything was awesome that day. You could see it's February, we're wearing short sleeve shirts uh, and everything was perfect. And, and it was a fantastic day and we had a great time and we really enjoyed the the match with all these, all these folks. And, and when we left that game and we got back home, you know, we really felt uh, unstoppable in, in many ways. We had plans. We had plans for work and we had plans for travel and adventures planned with our friends and our families. And literally less than one month later, this was our world, right? All of a sudden, right? One month, not even a month later from February 22nd, 2020, we are in lockdown, quarantined forever. Um, wishing my parents a happy anniversary via Zoom and chatting with my friends via Zoom and really just uh, living this brand new life that we did not expect at all less than one month earlier, which is fascinating, right? Looking into the future from here, everything was still going to be amazing. And from this perspective, well, we never saw that coming. And the interesting thing about that is that we can't predict the future, right? We are constantly guessing. We're making the best guesses that we can about based on what we know at the moment, right? This is, it's kind of an uncomfortable truth of life is, is that we are always guessing about what to do next, what's going to happen next. And, and, and look, these are educated guesses, right? But we're, we can only make these guesses based on what we know right now at that moment and what's come up until that point. And while that's an uncomfortable truth of life, it's also an uncomfortable truth at work as well, right? We, we, we think we can predict the future. We feel confident because of past experience and expertise um, that we, we know exactly what's going to happen moving forward. And the reality, once again, is that you can't. You can't predict the future, sadly. Um, what's interesting about all of that is that our ability to figure out if our guesses are right or wrong about what to do, what's coming next, what plans we should make, have improved dramatically. When I started working professionally, a couple of years after starting to work professionally, I worked at America Online and we made these the software that went on these CDs. Uh, if you're old enough to have received those CDs in the mail, you're welcome. <laughs> worked on that for a long time. <laughs> um, we made a lot of those CDs, in fact, uh, 15 million at a time. And it took us, you know, it used to take us months uh, and occasionally a year or, or longer to find out if the choices that we made in the, in the design, the implementation, the building of that software were right or wrong because we made guesses, right? We took guesses about what features made sense, what designs made sense, what copy made sense, what workflows made sense. Um, and it took us literally months and sometimes years to find out if we're right or wrong. Now, the good news about that, about that ability to, to sort of find out if our educated guesses were right or wrong is that since then, right? Since the days of CD-based software, the time to learn 
whether your guess was right or wrong has shortened dramatically. Today, basically, you can learn whether your idea was right or wrong, or your, your, your implementation was right or wrong, or your design was right or wrong, as fast as you want, right? As fast as, as you want to find out, and, as, and you're willing to invest to find out. So this graphic is from a very successful book called The Phoenix, the Phoenix Project by Gene Kim. And he talks about the frequency that uh, the, you know, these traditionally native digital companies deploy. We're talking about 23,000 deploys a day at Amazon in your backyard, Google at 5,500 a day, Netflix at 500 a day, right? Every one of those deployments is an opportunity for us to put something into the hands of our users and into our customers and an opportunity to learn whether that something actually made a difference to those folks, right? Did it actually deliver value? And the interesting thing about that is this fundamentally changes the nature of the medium that we use to deliver value, right? If you think about it sort of in this world, right? This was a static medium. At some point we had to say the software stops today and we're going to print 15 million copies of this and send it out to people in the mail. When you're deploying 23,000 times a day, the software never stops. And the nature of the software, the, 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 the delivery method for the value that we're creating is continuous. We're building these continuous systems that just go on and on and on forever. And we have to decide what's good, what did what worked, what didn't work, where do we change, where do we move forward? And there's uh, you know a, a tremendous opportunity to build learning into our process because simply because of the technological infrastructure that we have in place today. Now, on top of that technological infrastructure, we also have uh, methods and tools to help us reduce the risk of guessing incorrectly and wasting effort. So even if we can deploy very, very quickly, the things that we put out in the, into the world stand a higher chance of success when we use things like design thinking, like research, like customer interviews, like agile software development ideas, um, product thinking, empowered teams, right? All of these, all of these concepts, these methods and these tools and these ways of working help us reduce the risk of shipping something that isn't going to work. Even if we can learn quickly, we can reduce the risk of doing that. So we've got a tremendous convergence of technological capability and, and methodological capabilities coming together to help us make better guesses about what we should build, how we should design it, how we should implement it to deliver real value to our customers. And what's interesting is that despite that, despite those pieces all being in place, and to be super clear, those pieces have been in place for years at this point, and sometimes decades for some of this stuff, there is one practice that continues to slow us down, to, to continues to slow down the success of mitigating the risk of guessing incorrectly, right? These efforts to put out ideas are regularly hamstrung by the overwhelming desire of most organizations, certainly the ones that I work with, to manage to outputs, right? To manage to outputs. Now, what does that mean, managing to outputs? Managing to outputs means the, 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 the general directive, whether it's from an executive or from a client or from, from a, a product manager or team leader or whoever it is, is to make me a thing, right? Go and build me a traffic light. When in reality, what we're actually trying to do is to solve a problem. But someone has decided, right, that the, the optimal solution for this problem is a thing, in, in this case, uh, a traffic light, right? When in reality, it's certainly in this situation, I don't think a traffic light would help anybody at all. But the fundamental difference is, is that we still think about things in terms of output, this idea of, well, I'm going to make a thing and I know exactly what it's going to look like and what it's going to do and the impact that it's going to have on people rather than approaching every situation that we have as a problem to solve with the goal of identifying a, an outcome, a customer behavior, a user behavior that tells us that we actually delivered value. 
right? The risk is that we guess too much up front. Now, look, that there are situations where managing the outputs does actually make sense. And those situations are high certainty, low risk situations. Those situations lend themselves to planning to specific output. We know what we're building. We know what it will look like. We know what goes into it. We know what it will cost. And most importantly, we know what most people will do with it when we put it into their hands. And that makes sense to plan to a very specific deliverable, right? We're building a bridge, we're building a tunnel, we're building this particular tower, right? There's, there's, there's low risk and there's high certainty in those situations. But for everything else, right? We know that the future is unpredictable and it's, it's difficult for us to adapt to the things that we can't see coming if we're focused on shipping output, on shipping features, right? We, if we use this sort of very targeted approach, this fixed scope approach, when the world throws obstacles at us or challenges or surprises or competitive threats or pandemics, it becomes very, very difficult for organizations to change uh, their goal, to change their planning, to change what they're actually going to work on. So we have to work from what we do know and what we know now. And as we start to think about how do we plan work and how do we start to think about what, what, how to build these educated guesses, we know right now what people need to do in the systems that we're building, right? We know, we know what they're trying to do. We know what they are actually doing in the system. We can measure that, right? We know why they're doing that. If we're lucky, right? If we have researchers, if we have access to customers, if we, we have people who know how to do that, if we're lucky, we know why they're behaving in this particular way. And we know what we need as a business to be successful. Those are the things that can help inform our educated guesses about how to move forward, right? The thing that we don't know, right? The thing that we don't know is how to solve our users' needs, right? We have guesses. We have educated guesses, right? We can try to predict what products, features, and solutions make sense now, but doing that runs the risk of being wrong in the future when we actually build and ship it, right? Because the work that we choose to build is filled with untested assumptions. Now, we believe that those un untested assumptions will drive some user behavior, but we don't have the evidence to do that. And so managing to a specific deliverable becomes problematic in a world driven by continuous systems and continuous change where we can't actually predict the future. And so instead, what we need are human-centric goals. That's what we're looking for. We wanna move away from focusing on delivering a thing and instead move towards solving real problems for real customers, for real humans in a meaningful way, and in a way that's meaningful to them. And so if we're gonna set goals in a more human-centric way, we can use OKRs to do that, right? Now, I wanna talk about what OKRs are, and I wanna show you how setting goals with OKRs really enables that human-centric perspective, right? So if we start with just a brief definition, is this directly pulled from the book itself, right? OKRs, objectives and key results, it's a goal-setting framework. And to be clear, it's a team goal-setting framework. It's for teams that defines a qualitative goal. Why are we doing something, right? Let's align around that and then measures success towards that goal by achieving specific outcomes. What are people doing, right? Rather than measuring the completion of tasks or the deployment of work product, right? That's the fundamental difference in uh, thinking about OKRs. OKRs don't measure the delivery of output as success. They measure outcomes, okay? Now, if we're going to implement OKRs, one of the foundational things that we have to buy into is this idea that everyone has a customer. Now, that may seem obvious, right? Uh, if you work in a B2C setting, right, it's pretty obvious, right? The end consumer is your customer. But if you work uh, on, an, on an internal procurement system, for example, your customer in this particular case could be a third-party vendor. Uh, if you work in a B2B situation, the buyer on the client side or the user on the client side is the customer that you have. If you work on an internal team, 
It's your colleagues, right? So you work on a platform team, uh, a data uh, science team, an infrastructure, a security team, uh, an API team, whatever it is, it's your internal colleagues. It's other folks inside the organization that are your customers. Everybody who comes to work makes a thing and that thing gets consumed by other humans. And our goal is to make sure that whatever it is that we're producing for those other humans, be them, be they our actual customers, vendors, clients, internal colleagues, other folks that we work with, is solving a problem for them and is meeting a real need in a meaningful way for them. And the way that we do that is we measure their behavior. Okay, because that's our goal. Now, there's as as you know, because a lot of you work in UX and research, you know that uh Human beings um, do strange things. <laughs> Humans are are complex and unpredictable, right? So just because we we know what we think they're going to do, right? When we actually go and see them behave using our systems and the products that we built for them, they do things that we never uh, expected them to do, right? There are people people do a lot of interesting things <laughs> with the products that that we give to them, um, and we don't exactly know why. We have to understand that, um, even if we get to a point where we've figured out what people are going to do with, with a particular system over time, right? That behavior isn't static. That behavior emerges through the use of our products as well. So even if we built a thing and people start behaving one way, over time, they start doing very, very different things with those products. And what's amazing, by the way, between these two screenshots that I have on the screen is that there's four years between them and, and you know, the, the, the behavior is evolving and not for the better <laughs> on these particular systems, right? And certainly not for what they were originally intended for. And so kind of keeping in mind that while we're targeting human behavior as our goal, that behavior isn't static and people are going to do things that we did not expect them to do with our system, right? So as we start to think about what is the desired goal that we're trying to set with our objectives and key results, we have to ask the question, who does what by how much? That helps us answer the question. And the way that we answer that question is with outcomes, right? Outcomes are measurable changes in human behavior that drive business results. And you can see the conversation is right there, right? A measurable change in human behavior, right? Who's who's behaving, right? What are they doing? What is the what is the behavior that they're currently doing, right? And how much change in that behavior is meaningful enough to tell us that we've actually delivered something of value, right? And and as we start to set goals, and I come, I'm going to come back to this a couple of times, it's not a coincidence that that's the title of our book, right? You know you've written a human-centric goal, a human-centric objectives and key results statement when it answers the question, who does what by how much, right? Now, the interesting thing about outcomes, these measurable changes in human behaviors, is that they are the things that tell us when we've delivered customer value. If we can ship 23,000 times a day, right, the, the delivery of the feature becomes a non-event. We're not sure if we delivered value. The way that we know that we've delivered value is when we see people change their behavior in a meaningful way, meaningful to them and meaningful to us. The other benefit of setting goals with outcomes and building outcomes into your objectives and key results is that outcomes tell us when we're done. Now, remember, we're building these continuous systems that we can work on forever. It's not like we're building a bridge and then it's finished, right? We're continuing to optimize and improve and learn and hopefully sunset some features. When do we know when, like, when have we built enough? When have we designed enough? When is it time to move on to a different part of the user experience? Right. When we measure user behavior and we say, look, when we get enough people going through this workflow successfully, we're going to move on to something else. And so instead of measuring the delivery of the workflow as success, we're measuring people passing through the workflow successfully. And then once enough of those folks are doing that, that's what tells us when we're done. And so outcomes are very powerful in, in, in goal setting because not only do they tell us that we've actually built and designed something of value, but that we can move on to the next thing. And so we're going to incorporate outcomes into the writing of our objectives and key results statements. 
as we move forward. Okay, now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how to write those objectives and key results. So we're going to break it down into objectives and then the key result side. The objective side of the conversation is the goal. It's the qualitative side of the conversation. Your objectives should be uh, inspirational and aspirational. There should be a lot of superlatives in your objective statements. The, the easiest, the simplest, the definitive, uh, in the, the most engaging, the most effective, uh, the most reliable, things of those nature, things of that nature. Uh, your objective should be action oriented. It should be clear what, what the value is. And, and ideally it's supporting the higher purpose of your business unit, of your team, uh, of your organization. And your objective should be time bound. Now, I have a question for you. Um, what's not on this list for your objective statements? If you could just maybe put it in the chat, right? What are there? There's two very specific things, exactly. Measurable, thank you, Deanna. Measurable, no metrics are in this list. And there's one other very big glaring thing, in my opinion, missing from this list. What else is missing from this list? What do you think? Who, maybe, maybe it's not what I'm looking for, but you're right. It's not there necessarily, although it could, it could potentially be there. Any other guesses about what's missing from this, from this list in your objectives? What should, should definitely is not going into your objective statement. We've got metrics, number one, because it's qualitative. And the other, well, well, I think, I think it should, should be clearly valuable. What's missing from this list is features. Features is missing from this list. Exactly. How are we going to achieve this objective, right? What are we going to build, right? The things that are missing from this are metrics and features, right? Our, our objective statements are going to be qualitative. They're going to be focused on delivering real value to the organization, um, but they are, are not, the, it's the reason we get out of bed every day, right? We want to build the most effective authentication system for any e-commerce platform in the world, something along those lines, right? The way that we get to a good objective statement is we start with the problem that we're trying to solve. Again, instead of starting with the solution, we're going to start with the problem, right? What's the business problem your team is tackling in the next cycle? What are you trying to solve for? Why is it a problem? What do you know about the root cause of the issue right now? And then what we try to do is articulate that as a business problem. Now, here's an example. Okay, this is, this is obviously hypothetical, right? We run a continuing education learning platform for lawyers. We've noticed customers sign up for our service. They take only one course and leave telling us that our user experience is the main issue, right? This drives up our acquisition and sales costs and reduces profit. So this is the problem, the hypothetical problem that we're trying to solve as an organization. So we start with the problem statement. And if we take that problem statement and we flip it into a positive statement that answers the question, well, if I solve the problem, what does that world look like? Right? If I solve this problem, then what I've done is, uh, what, I, what I plan on doing is I wanna build an engaging continuing education product for the entirety of a lawyer's career by the end of the year. And what I've done here is I've turned that problem statement into an objective statement. If you go back to my checklist here for just a minute, right? Qualitative, inspirational, action-oriented, valuable, higher purpose and time-bound. It's qualitative, right? It's an engaging, continuing education product. It's what we do, so it's it's going to be engaging, whatever that means. Uh, it's valuable in the sense that this is this is the the higher purpose of the organization. Uh, it's it's inspirational because we want this to be something, hopefully, for the duration of a of a lawyer's career. And it's time box. We want to get that done by the end of the year. Okay, so it meets all the criteria for a good objective statement. Now, as you're writing your objective statements. We want to write objectives that our team can achieve. So it really depends on where you're working in the organization. If you're in charge of a business unit, the goals of that business unit can certainly be your objective, right? We're, we're looking at the entire thing. But if you work on just one slice of the customer journey, then your objective should reflect the goals for that part only because that's the that's your sphere of influence, right? That's the world that you can impact. So I used authentication before. That's a really good example, right? Uh, we, we want, uh, we're going to write an objective that reflects the impact that we'd like to have, the goal that we have 
for the authentication part of the workflow and nothing else. Okay, because that's the world that we can impact. We want to focus our objectives that we can achieve as a team within our sphere of influence. Now, once we've got our objectives in place, we're going to talk about uh, putting in the key results. Now, key results are the quantitative side of the conversation. They answer the question, how will we know we've achieved the objective? And so our key results are going to be quantifiable. They're going to be metrics. Let's be super clear. Uh, ideally, they are ratios or rates, which tells us how we're trending. Obviously, you need a baseline for that. If you don't have a baseline, we can use absolute numbers initially, but we want to move into ratios or rates pretty quickly. Our key results should be aggressive. We shouldn't be hitting 100% of our key results consistently. We should They should be stretch goals. They need to be verifiable with evidence. We should be able to look at data, analytics, reporting, market research, customer research, et cetera. To, to justify that. And then finally, they must be outcomes. Your key results must be outcomes. So kind of tying this conversation together, your key results must be measures of human behavior. That's how we know that we have delivered on the objective is we've impacted customer behavior, user behavior in a very real way, okay? Let me ask the question again. What's not on this list? There's one thing in this case, because we do have metrics on this list. There's one thing that's missing from this list that was missing from the previous list as well. What is it this time around? It's the same thing. Features, exactly. You'll notice that throughout our conversation about objectives and key results, we are not going to talk about features when we set our goals. In, 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 in the goal setting conversation, we are not going to talk about features, right? Because again, that's managing to output. We want to manage to outcomes. And so we're going to make those outcomes our key results. Now, the way that we get to good key results is we start by defining our target audience. If our goal is to change behavior, whose behavior do we want to change? Existing customers, prospective customers, users, colleagues, third-party vendors, all of those customers that we talked about before. And then once we've identified our target audience, we ask the key question, what will those people be doing differently if we achieve the objective? How will their behavior change? In other words, if we do a great job, right? We choose the right feature, we design it properly, we write the right content, we, de we deploy it in the most meaningful way, right? It's, it's the right combination of code, copy, and design. What will folks be doing differently, right? To tell us that indeed, this was the right solution to achieve the objective. And so in my online learning platform for lawyers, I want to see a 50% decrease in the number of existing customers leaving the service due to user experience, right? That's a good key result. And it answers the question that I mentioned before, who existing customers does what leaving the service less, right? By how much 50% less, right? That helps us answer that particular question. Now, we don't actually get into the solutions of any of this, right? What's interesting about this is as we start to put together the, the goals, right? The conversation stays away from the feature conversation, at least initially. Let, let me give you an example. Let me, let, me, let me share with you an example uh, for this. Let's kind of take it out of digital for a second, and we'll talk about this, this example. Let's imagine for a second that uh, all of us have new jobs. All of us are the owners of a mattress store, a brick and mortar mattress store. In fact, I've got a photo of your mattress store right here. I'm gonna ask you to open up the chat one more time, and I'm gonna ask you a couple questions in the chat uh, about this, about your new mattress store, okay? Um, if you think about your mattress store, you're the owner of the mattress store, what are the high level measures of success for your business? What are you measuring? What are the high level measures of the success of your mattress store? As, as, the, as the, the chief executive of your mattress store, what, num what numbers do you care about on a daily basis when you come into work? A add some stuff in the chat. What are you measuring as the owner of the mattress store? What do you care about? Nothing? <laughs> yeah, there we go. How many mattresses did I sell? Good. Number of units sold. What else? Number of sales. 
new customer acquisition, conversion rates, returns, profit, exactly. We're looking at those impact metrics for the business. Terrific. Now, let me ask you a second question, okay? What are the behaviors that you might observe in the store that might lead to a sale of a mattress? What are the behaviors that you might observe in the store that might that would lead to a sale of a mattress? People trying mattresses. Very good. Interactions with customers. A bit of ambiguity in some of these answers. I'm going to ask some clarifying questions. Um, how do you know that customers are happy with the service? Like, what are they doing to tell you that they're happy with the service? I'll ask another clarifying question while you're typing an answer. Uh, what is the, uh, what, what do you mean by client pattern? What does that mean? I like time spent in the store. That's good. That's a good behavior. Maybe they're going to buy a mattress. They're spending time in the store. They recommended their store to a friend. Uh, the number of people actually coming into the store. Very good, right? Foot traffic coming into the store. Um, ultimately spending money. Yes, buying 100%, right? What happens before they spend money? They lie on a mattress. They lie on more than one mattress. Um, if uh, let me ask you a question to help with this. Um, if you are, uh, if you sleep next to somebody on a regular basis, are you coming in to buy that mattress alone? I'm going to give you the answer to that one. The answer is no. <laughs> you are not. <laughs> okay, you're coming in with your partner because you got to sleep on that mattress together. Um, all those things, right? People coming to the store coming with a partner, trying a mattress, trying more than one mattress, asking questions, spending time in the store, interacting with, 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 the, with the staff. These are all the behaviors that you can observe in the store. Now, last question, okay? What might you do to the store to drive those behaviors, right? How might you design the store to drive the behaviors that we just talked about? What would you do? Make beds that work. Yeah. And people get sleep. Yeah. Good. What else? How would you get folks into the store? How would you get them to try a mattress? How would you get them to try more than one mattress? Okay. Put more models on display for customers to try. I like that. Right. Right. By the way, lots of hints in the photo on the screen. <laughs> window promotions. Absolutely. Put up signs in the windows that say sale or come on in. Absolutely. Uh, the, yeah, the, the, the wavy balloon people, right? All together. I love those guys. Those are great. I love that. Excellent. I don't know if that only works for used cars. Maybe it works for that. What else? Cozy environment. Very good. Again, hints. There are lots of hints in the photo, right? Imagine, imagine you're going into the, a mattress store and you, want to, you actually want to try a mattress, right? But you have your shoes on. You're jumping on that mattress with your shoes on. Public restroom, also an option as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Look, you're not going to jump on that mattress with your shoes on. You're probably also not going to take your shoes off in public, right? So what are we going to do to the mattresses to encourage people to lie down on them and not have to take their shoes off? The answer is in the photo. Covers, like little covers down at the end so you can rest, rest your dirty shoes on that yellow stripey thing. Right, and put your head on the pillow. Staff to help people, right? Excellent. All right, good. All of those things, cozy environment, mattress selection, covers, um, uh, smart staff, right? Uh, window promotions. All of those things are outputs. Those are all the features of your store. All of those things are designed to drive outcomes, to drive behavior changes, getting people into the store, into the store with their partners, to try out a mattress, to, add, to spend time in the store and to ultimately buy a mattress, right? If those elements, those design elements of your store don't drive that behavior, those design elements were wrong. They didn't work. And we have to try something else. The measure of success for our store is not, do we have window promotions? Do we have bed covers? The measure of success 
is did people come in with their partner, lie on more than one mattress, spend time in the store, and ultimately buy a mattress? And so the variable, when we start to manage the outcomes and we start to manage with OKRs, the variable in our conversation is the product. It's the features, it's the design, it's, it's those are the various elements. And I think that's a radical concept for a lot of organizations because generally speaking in most companies, certainly the ones that I work with, the product has never been the variable, right? The variables have been scope and deadlines and maybe design choices, but never will we ship the thing, right? When we manage to OKRs, it's the customer behavior portion, the goal that's fixed, and it's the, the product and the design and the implementation of the product that is the variable because there is an infinite number of choices that you can make to try to impact customer behavior in a positive way, right? So we build that into our goals, right? A good OKR become the number one seller of mattresses in the Metro Barcelona area by the end of the year. How do I know? Well, for me, what I know is that if I see 150% increase in foot traffic to the physical store, a 50% increase in online to offline conversions, and a third of my foot traffic coming in with their partners, that tells me that I'm the number one seller of mattresses in the area by the end of the year. That's what I've decided is, is a meaningful metric for me, right? If I'm building that, that uh, online learning platform for lawyers, um, I want to build an engaging continuing education product for the entirety of a lawyer's career by the end of the year. How do I know? Well, each user will take at least three courses each year. That's a 300% lift. 25% of new customers come from word of mouth. And each law firm that signs up registers at least 50% of its staff, okay? Now, that to me is, those are the metrics that matter to me as the person who's in charge of this business to tell me that I'm building an engaging product for my target audience, right? That's what I think is, is relevant. Let me show you one more example and we'll talk about why, why this is important and then we'll leave some time for Q&A. I really like this example. This example is uh, from the medical world, the healthcare world. This comes from the Cleveland Clinic. Cleveland Clinic is an, a, it's an international healthcare organization, perhaps unsurprisingly based in Cleveland. And they publish their OKRs publicly annually uh, on their website. And, um, and I, I picked a couple that I really like. This first one um, is best place to receive care anywhere. It's qualitative, it's aspirational, it's inspirational, it's clear value, and it's time boxed because it's an annual goal. And the way that they measure is in the absolute number of serious safety events. So they want that obviously to go down significantly and in the rate of serious safety events. Of all these safety events that happen, what percentage are serious? We wanna get that down as low as possible as well. That's a measure of human behavior that tells them that this is the best place to receive care anywhere. They've got a second one on here that I really like as well, which is an internally facing one best place to work in healthcare. So we're trying to build the best place to work in healthcare. How do we know? What are people doing differently if we've built the best place to work in healthcare? Well, people are recommending the Cleveland Clinic as a place to work to their friends. We want to see that percentage go up. And uh, people aren't quitting, especially people that we like, right? No, the, the regrettable turnover is going down, right? We want to see that behavior. People continuing to work here, choosing to work here, coming to work every day. That tells us that we've built the best place to work in healthcare. And again, we're measuring human behavior in all of these cases. Now, the uh, I just want to answer a few common questions about OKRs, and then and then we can do some Q and A for the time that we have left. There is. You know, this question comes up again and again and again. Like we set goals already, like why should we use OKRs? And I think there's a lot of benefits, but these are the top three that I've come up with so far, right? Because we don't put features in our objectives and because we don't put features in our key results, we are explicitly demanding that our teams do discovery work to determine solutions most likely to succeed. They have to go out and talk to customers. They have to understand their target audience. They have to do research. They have to build prototypes and do design work and, and you know design thinking work and product discovery work and lean UX work to figure out the best combination of code copy and, the de and design that drives the desired behavior change. In doing so, the organization starts to become more customer centric because we're talking to customers, we're dealing with them on a regular basis where we may not have done that in the past. And we're building a much more empathetic culture that understands our users much better. 
And then finally, we are increasing the agility of our organization. Because, why? Because our goal is not to deliver a thing, it's to change behavior. And as we start to work on a thing and we're measuring whether it's changing behavior, if it isn't, we now have the evidence to justify changing course. And changing course based on evidence is agility. It is organizational agility, right? That's the goal in all of this, right? Is to, is to be able to, to pivot quickly from solutions that aren't going to meet customer needs to better serve those customer needs. And that's really important. The last thing I'll talk about very quickly, and then we'll do some questions, is what, what, what makes OKRs challenging. And there's a lot of stuff, really, because it, it's a simple framework that's difficult to implement. But in my experience working with organizations and helping to implement this, these are really the four things that seem to come up again and again and again. One of the, one of the things that makes OKRs challenging is uh, when we try to push goals down from the top on, onto the teams, right? So instead... We want to set OKRs by working top down and bottom up. So we've got our leaders setting strategic goals and then teams saying, okay, boss, here's how we can support those strategic goals with our own goals. And then ideally we meet, we meet in the middle, we negotiate, we talk about what's relevant, what's uh, a duplicate effort, et cetera. But ideally we're working both top down and bottom up to avoid pushing down goals onto teams. The other thing that all, all, often tends to happen is the organization will set strategic goals. Those strategic goals are going to be something like revenue, right? And then we give revenue to the authentication team. And now the authentication team has a revenue goal and they're like, eh, we're four steps away from generating revenue. It's not fair to us to sign up for goals that we can't actually influence. Um, Another trap that comes up a lot, and I've talked about this a lot because to me, this is the, the kind of the, the hinge that success pivots around for OKRs, is if your key result is an output, then the system really starts to fail. And, and it's because shipping features is an infinite process. If, if your key result is, a, is, is an output, it's a feature, we're back to fixed time, fixed scope work, right? The agility, the ability to learn, the ability to pivot, is gone because now we're committed to delivering a thing, right? With feature-based key results, we're basically back to doing waterfall and risking trying to predict the future, okay? Another really big challenge, hopefully, I'm guessing one that you're probably familiar with with this group, is that once we've got these goals in place, our teams need both an ideation and a decision-making process for determining what to build, right? How do we decide what the best ideas are and how do we determine which ones to invest in? That's where product discovery comes in, research and design and prototyping and experimentation, right? This is the process that enables continuous learning on teams. Many of the organizations that I work with don't know how to do this. And there are some organizations that do know how to do this, but they don't really allow their teams to do product discovery and research. And so we've got to make sure that those are skills that the team has and that they're allowed to actually deploy those skills. Without that, we're just gonna make a guess and build it and hope that it works. The last thing I'll say is this, uh, for, as far as traps go, um, is incentives. Now, if you work in a situation where you can influence the incentives of your team, you can make a real difference in the success of OKRs because typically companies are incentivized, uh, are incentivizing their, their folks for delivery, for production, for making a thing. If OKRs are going to work, we have to start shifting incentives away from making a thing, right? I'm going to reward you not for shipping the app. I'm going to reward you for learning, for being customer centric, for making evidence-based decisions rather than just for blindly delivering a thing and hoping that it works. And so that's one of the one of the kind of the final traps there at the organizational level. Now look, OKRs are a simple concept, but they're difficult to implement. They're hard and they're supposed to be difficult because it's a goal setting framework, it aligns the organization and it pushes the organization in a specific direction. And it should be a direction that we debate and that we choose together, right? As a leadership team, as, as, as product development teams to go in that particular direction so that we can serve the customer more successfully and then ultimately serve the business more successfully. And so with that, I just wanna say, uh, thanks very much for listening. I know it's, it's early morning or it's morning at least. Uh, I appreciate you. Uh, listening to, to the presentation. Um, I'd love to take your questions now. If you have questions afterwards, that's my email address on the screen. I did not forget the M 
It's jeff at gothealth.co. And um, I'd love to hear what questions you have now. We didn't, uh, there's no Q and A on this because it's a, it's a, it's a webinar. Oh, I see one. Okay. How can OKRs, Nate says, how can OKRs be formulated to prevent individuals from resorting to shortcuts in order to achieve goals? Yes. The Wells Fargo fake account scandal is top of mind. Uh, yes. So the answer to the question, Nate, is to decouple incentives from key results. That's the answer. Right? And the reason why that Wells Fargo scandal happened and lots of other scandals like that happen is when we tie incentives to key results, people cheat. People game the system. People want to get paid. They want to get the reward, right? So we open up bank accounts for our dead relatives and, and, and for people who don't exist and multiple accounts for the same people. The way that this has to happen is a decoupling of incentives from key results, right? So that's when I talked about incentives a minute ago, the rewards that I suggested weren't about building, uh, about hitting your key results. It was about building learning into your process, making evidence-based decisions, right? Getting closer to the customer. How you measure that, how you reward that, that's not easy. And I, you know, that's, that's a good conversation to have, but the key results have to be decoupled from the, uh, incentives. All right. Next question. How often do you think OKR should be updated? Guessing varies by industry. Sure. Uh, I mean, yeah, it, it depends the best answer ever for any question, right? But look, let, let's, let, let's, let's put a rule of thumb out there, right? So your objectives should last at least a year. I mean, I'm sorry, not at least a year. In my opinion, objectives, roughly speaking, 12 months, is probably a maximum length for an objective, um, and key results. We're gonna we're gonna base them on a, on quarterly targets, and then we're gonna check in at the end of every quarter, and we're going to assess what we shipped, what we learned, what's still true, what's no longer true, what still makes sense. How are we tracking towards our key results? Should we keep going? Should we adjust them? Does the objective still make sense? And so objectives, maybe they last a year. Key results last a quarter. Maybe they last longer. Because look, the reality is, right, when we come up with our with our targets for our key results, I think there was a question earlier up in the chat. How did you come up with 50%? I mean, look, I came up with it because it was, uh, I made it up, <laughs> number one. <laughs> but number two, we're always making it up. We're making up numbers that are meaningful to us as an organization to say that this was successful, right? So if, if we've got a, you know, uh, uh, an attrition rate of 90%, right? If we can reduce that in half, right? That's significant to the business. So we're going to pick, we're going to pick numbers that make sense. Now, inevitably we can make an educated guess about what numbers make sense based on data, based on uh, historical evidence, based on data science, et cetera. But at the end of the day, we're making an educated guess, as I mentioned at the beginning, right? And so at the end of the Q1, we said, hey, we want to reduce attrition by 50%. And the team could come up and say, hey, listen, we reduced attrition by 15, 20%. We think maybe we can squeeze another 5% out of this, but there's no way we're hitting 50%. Okay, now we've got evidence to decide whether we continue to pursue this or we pivot and we try something else. The team could come back and say, you know what? We crushed it. We hit 70% reduction in attrition in Q1. What do you want to do next? Right? And so these quarterly check-ins are critical for making sure the goals are still relevant, that they still make sense based on what we've now done over the past quarter and moving forward. Okay. So that's roughly, that's a, a rule of thumb for that. Yeah, there it is. 50% decrease of churn. I see it there. Um, again, because that, you know, as a business, I've done the math, that's a meaningful enough change. It's aggressive. It's a lot higher than we've had before. The story I've told for years, just to kind of demonstrate this, is I used to work at a company called The Ladders in New York City a thousand years ago. And we had a metric, The Ladders was a job board for people who made um, uh, $100,000 or more back then, at least. Um, and we had employers and we had job seekers, kind of like a dating site trying to find each other. And the one of the leading indicators that my team was 
assigned to improve, one of the key results was job seeker response rate. It was the number of time, the percentage of the time that a job seeker responded to an employee communication in our, an employer communication in our system. Okay. Uh, we knew that that was a leading indicator of retention. We were a subscription service for both sides of the ecosystem. And so I got onto the team and the job seeker response rate was 14% when we started the project. And my boss said, your goal is to hit 75%. Why 75? Well, it's more than 14. <laughs> 100% is impossible. And so, and 75 is a, such a significant in, in, increase that that'll be good enough for a while and we can move you on to something else. And so we worked on that for a quarter. And after a quarter, we got it, you know, we got the job seeker response rate up to, I don't know, 35, 38%. And we learned a few things and we had some ambition for the next quarter. And we told the, you know, the product boss about what we were going to do. And he said, great, you have another quarter, go for it. And we worked for another quarter and we got it to about 68% after about six months worth of work. And, you know, the company said, you know what, 68% is close enough to 75. It's much better than 14. And we've got more important work to do right now. So we're going to move you off to something else. So that's how we make these decisions and move that forward. Okay. Uh, let's do one, let's see if we can at least one more question in here. Um, not understanding why features was missing in those lists, right? Features, because we don't want to manage to output, right? That's the, that's the risk here, right? Managing to output means that we are going to make a series of untested assumptions about what we should build, what it should look like, how it should work. And, and we're going to build the whole thing and ship it. And that's just a lot of risk, right? It's going to take time, effort, testing, marketing, go-to-market plans, et cetera, to build something that we're not sure is going to work, right? Um, instead, and, and we're going to focus on actual customer problems and try to understand what's getting in their way of being successful today. And then if we remove that obstacle, how will their behavior change? Because it's their behavior change that ultimately indicates that we've delivered something of value, right? Making a thing is no longer an event when you can deploy 23,000 times a day. Impacting customer behavior is far more meaningful, especially since those regular deployments are all learning opportunities to figuring out exactly how to design a thing to move forward. Okay. Uh, I think squeeze one more in here. What are the consequences when teams fail to achieve their OKRs? Everybody gets fired. That's what I say. I'm just kidding. <laughs> How is accountability maintained for teams when incentives or goals are decoupled? That's a really great question, right? So look, um, the consequences for teams failing to achieve their OKRs should be a discussion about what's happening, what we're learning, why we're not hitting our key result goals and what we're going to be doing differently, right? So I think a team can be forgiven for missing their key results for a quarter, but they have to come to that quarterly check-in and say, here's what we tried. Here's what we learned. Here's what worked. Here's what didn't work. And here's, here's what we plan on doing in the next quarter. As long as the team is experimenting, testing, learning, and adjusting course and, and continuing to try new things, they're moving forward right? If after two quarters, a team is continuing to test and learn and experiment and still not hitting their key results, there's something, something flawed in the assumptions around the key results, most likely. I think that's a fair conversation to have to say, are we solving the right problem? Are we targeting the right behavior? Is this a realistic goal, right? To really kind of try to get a sense of why everything that we're trying isn't moving things forward. Right? I think that, 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 requires that kind of conversation and potentially a pivot. I think the real risk when we talk about accountability and consequence, right? It sounds, it sounds kind of negative, right? Um, is teams that attempt to hit key results, but then don't learn anything from their work and kind of keep making the same mistakes over and over and over again. I think in that situation, there needs to be a bit of a reckoning that says, look, you folks aren't doing product discovery well you aren't applying your learning and you're missing your goals. And so in that sense, the incentive, remember kind of the, the general guideline I put forward for incentive is customer centricity, evidence-based decision-making, a continuous learning and improvement, those types of things. 
teams like that aren't displaying those qualities, right? And so we need to figure out why that's happening. Either they don't know how to do it. Um, they don't feel like there's psychological safety for them to do that kind of work and then contradict a high, a higher paid person's opinion, right? There's some, there's stuff to be dug into there that um, doesn't require punishing a team necessarily for not hitting their key results. But clearly there's a pattern of a team missing quarter over quarter, something's broken. Either the goal is wrong or the team doesn't know how to do the work and that, that requires an intervention. I think that's about time for everything today. I'm gonna to put my email address um, back in the chat again. If you have any questions or you wanna follow up with me about anything, please do send me an email. If you like what you heard today, and uh, you want to read more about it in our amazing new book, Who Does What By How Much, go to okr-book.com and sign up there. Otherwise, follow me on LinkedIn. I would love to, to see you there. And Alan, thank you so much for inviting me. I hope this was valuable and helpful.